on, a, a, for example, a disk or a network. So who can give me an example of data that would be available in a RAM, in the, in the memory, but which would not be available on a disk, or you wouldn't be able to sniff from the network? Your clipboard? Clipboard, <coughs> very good example. Very clipboard. Strokes. Although a clipboard, could you be more specific because... I mean, uh, if you do a screenshot, it's, uh, so if it's temporary in the RAM. A screenshot? Yeah, that's a very good one. A screenshot, as long as I don't save it to disk, um, it, it might be on a clipboard or it might be in a RAM, but it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, on the disk. But it could be very interesting for me to look at the screenshot that you uh, made. That's a, that's a good example. Any other day? There's so much, but already I can, with the screenshot, there's another one that is really close, which might be interesting. <laughs> screenshot, what, what other uh, video data might be available on the computer? Uh, it's like I'm endorsing, uh, I don't even like this. Pepsi, black Pepsi. We have uh, on the Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, what other video data might be available on our computer? D did you... No one? What is this? This is terrible. Where does this come from? <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm going to switch this off. Uh, audio. Very good. <laughs> test, test. It's not perfect. This is better. Um, we never do this, but I, I have to record it. It would be open and alive. I have to record it live. And uh, while I'm doing the presentation, and as you can see, that uh, doesn't always work as I would like it. Did you hear about the uh, about the recent hack by GHCQ from the UK, the, the British NSA, British uh, AIPD, who, made, who captured some oh, data? The, web <coughs> the webcam from Yahoo users. The webcam from Yahoo users. Yeah, did you hear that? Great, uh, great thing. What they did was that um, they captured. Uh, video data from all Yahoo accounts that they could get their hands on and every five minutes they took a picture of the uh, video stream and saved it in their database which they still have which is strange that they there's a lot to do about it but uh, they didn't destroy the data and they said that several percent I don't know how, how much of it 20 percent or so 20% was uh, explicit uh, photos, huh? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So that's uh, unbelievable. But this is the same thing. I mean, someone could be using their webcam, <coughs> although if we stream that webcam over the network, we would be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, capture it on the, on the network as well. But if we uh, use the webcam, if we just have the webcam on, but we don't stream it on the network, the data is still in the memory, it's in the RAM. These are two examples, but there are more examples um, of data that might be very interesting to us, which is which might not be available on the disk or the network or anything. If, um, let's go to, uh, to, to, to um, a, an offender who does something he shouldn't do, he or she shouldn't do, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing because uh, I know in Amsterdam there has been a, a big case about this, but this is a true case and it's, uh, this is exactly why memory forensics is so important also to law enforcement. We had the uh, case with, uh, with all the child uh, porn here in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and he did a few tricks to hide what he was doing. What tricks do you think that he used to hide his data on his computer? 
Yeah. Encryption. Encryption. Do you know which encryption? TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt, which is a very good form of uh, encryption. Now, if uh, if we have a system which is which is not live, which is switched off, so it's it's just a system. How easy would it be, do you think, to get to the data that is encrypted with TrueCrypt? Is it easy? Not, not, not at all easy. Now, we think it's very difficult. I mean, of course, we are not 100% sure. Uh, but the fact that the NSA bought a huge supercomputer to do uh, decryption, uh, brute force decryption, it makes, it makes us believe that probably there are some things out there that are difficult to hack, even for them. Uh, however, the reality is that uh, to agencies like the NSA, GHQ, uh, AIPB, uh, the police, the information is uh, pretty e even uh, uh, criminals, even when the data is encrypted, it's still not that difficult to get to the, to the data. What trick do they use? Because they don't decrypt it. That's the thing. What trick do they use? It had to be target. Did you see the target thing that you followed at all in America? Target is like uh, Albert Heijn in, in America. A supermarket chain, big supermarket. And uh, in America, a lot of people pay with their credit cards. And you know, the weak thing about the credit card is, is if you have the number, you don't even need a pin or anything, you can use it. And the good thing about a credit card, it typically has a, a high limit, spending limit. So it's, it's, it's a very nice thing to uh, get a hold of. If you now, Target did their security very well. So in this case, Target was hacked. Millions of credit card details got stolen, if, I, if I'm correct. And still, if we look at Target, if you look at what happened, they didn't really make any mistakes. All the data was always encrypted. So how did they get to that, to that data? What trick do you think they used? Hint. Huh? The password is stored in memory. The password is stored in memory. But even worse, not even the password is stored in memory when it comes to credit card the data. Files. Even the uh, Excel, it needs to be decrypted because I cannot use it in an encrypted form. So it has to be decrypted, it has to be in a decrypted form at some point while I'm processing it. And where would that be? In the RAM memory. Yeah. So uh, this is a weak point which uh, criminals attack when they uh, steal the credit card data from Target. They somehow infected the, uh, the register system uh, and what they did was uh, what's called a, a memory scraper or a RAM scraper, which just observed the RAM memory for those locations where the decrypted information was stored. But even if I don't have the decrypted data in the RAM, on a running system, and now we're back to the Robert M case with the, the child pornography, uh, what you need is the password to decrypt it. When he's using the system, he has that password somewhere in the memory. Well, maybe not the password itself. Uh, maybe the password is only used to get a decryption key. But when, I'm, when I have the, the, the TrueCrypt partition mounted, I need the decryption key in the RAM memory. So as long as it's mounted and the system is live, if I can get in the memory and I know where to look, bam, I have it. And if I'm not mistaken, Arnim, we are going to do a, a, a lab with that, a similar thing. To hunt down some information in the RAM uh, for yes. a key, decryption key or something. Um, not exactly decryption key, but yes. Yeah. But we will other sensitive data. Other sensitive data, so we will see how to uh, do that. This is a very common uh, uh, practice, and this is also why uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, encryption techniques don't offer any protection at all against agencies like the NSA, like the IFD, like the police, because uh, uh, they, if they suspect you, they will infect your system and it will just uh, steal your keys from your RAM memory. And the criminals do the same thing. I mean, they do exactly the same thing. 
to get to your game. This is the weak point of encryption. And this is a, although it's on the, on the, on the, on the, the, the normal desktop platforms like Windows and Linux is a pretty new technique that hasn't been used that much by criminals. It, it's, it's, it's a very common and old technique for uh, video consoles. I think uh, Arne will do a, a presentation on video consoles. Yeah, so you will see more about that later. But to hack those systems, they basically use the same kind of techniques because the cartridges or CD-ROMs or whatever, they are heavily encrypted, very difficult to get into them. But at some point in, in, in time, the, the decryption keys need to be in a RAM memory. So if I can get into them, uh, I can get the decryption key. And the weak point in, uh, in these systems is that there's only one key. And if I have the one key, I can, I can decrypt and play all the games. In, uh, yeah. The DVD, the DVD platform, same thing, had one key. Well, actually the DVD platform <coughs> had one key for every, um, every, every publisher. But they, all the, or not every publisher, they have one decryption key for every DVD uh, uh, manufacturer. I think you had a key for the Philips and you had a key for the Sony, if I'm, if I'm correct. But every player, or every CD has all the keys for every player, so it can decrypt. Uh, it, it, it can be decrypted on that player. And someone hacked the DVD system and got all the keys out and published them on the internet. And then the whole DVD platform was uh, broken. Let's see what else is on the on the list. Could contain missing link between data and uh, on other media. Yeah. This is more or less, the, the, uh, the decryption key is more or less one of the examples, but it could also be that data is, is in transit from one medium to another, for example from disk to the network, and there's some sort of transformation or translation done, or it could be that there's a, there's, there's a missing piece of information, like in a, in, a, in a database, a relational database, it could be that the relation between two entities is in the RAM, like uh, I don't know, a cache file or a, a, a picture that you find. And where does this picture come from? And that's only temporarily stored in RAM. How you got the picture? And maybe the, the picture is only stored on the disk as a sort of caching. Uh, but if you want to know where it came from, <coughs> you need to look in the, in the RAM. Contains information about the state of uh, the system and devices. Yeah, the operating system manages the system itself and all the devices. The, the, the hardware, what's the state of the hardware, what's the state of the printer, what's the state of the mouse, uh, which files are open, which files are read only, which files are write, read write access, um, which uh, processes are running, uh, which memory is allocated to which process, which process is linked to what device. All that information is only in RAM because it's maintained by the operating system. The operating system has a whole lot of uh, data structures. There's, uh, there's very good books that, that if, you, if you are into this, if you really like this, you should really buy the two books of uh, Windows internals, I think they're called, volume one and two, and they explain all the data structures of uh, Windows. And if you want to do this seriously, you need to have these books, and you need to uh, know uh, how to use the books and uh, dive into the data <coughs> in these books. But then, if you if you really get to know the uh, the contents of these books and, and the structures of, of how Windows is uh, structured internally, you can follow whatever's going on on the system, which processors are running, uh, which one is linked to what, but that's not easy, that's going to be quite a task to do. You can do the same for Linux or Unix, and it's uh, a little bit, it's, it's a little bit simpler on uh, Linux, it's only one book, uh, simpler data structures uh, than on uh, Windows. 
Memory forensics, time is a factor. Um, this is a paper from uh, Thurmond and Freiling. A uh, survey of main memory acquisition and, and analysis techniques for the Windows operating system. And they found out that uh, time is a factor. I don't think, I'm not sure whether I have the, uh, the, the table in, in the slides in the presentation about how long data stays in there, stays the same. Maybe, I don't know, we will see. But over time, the contents of your RAM memory will change. And this is pretty quick. I mean, all the time things are changing in your RAM memory. Uh, buffers are updated, things happen. I mean, processors are switched. This is, uh, uh, the good thing is, it's not as volatile as you might think it is. You might think that your complete RAM is changing all the time. This is not true. This is not true at all. Uh, mostly the operating system tables are changing, but even they, most of them don't change. Most of them, I should also switch off my phone. I hear someone else's phone. Uh oh. You can see that. Now I'm going um, to the uh, data structures that you can expect to change are data structures about uh, processes, threads, buffers, uh, I.O. buffers, uh, page files, uh, or, or information about page files. These things are pretty volatile. And maybe some data from, uh, from processes, but let's take Excel or Word. You don't change your whole letter. In, well, maybe you do search or replace, search uh, the, replace with the, uh, or, pen. Yeah, then you have a lot of changes all in one. But uh, typically, you don't do these things. I mean, in Excel, you change uh, uh, some data <coughs> here. Maybe in Word, you change a few lines here. So it's not as bad as, we, as you might think, but it is volatile. And it does change every second, every hundreds of a second. The, the RAM is changing somewhere. Tools are obtru obtrusive. Yeah, the problem is if I have a running system, so this, this system is running. Right? Let's take the example of, uh, of uh, Robert M, the, uh, the guy who had the child porn on his computer. They, uh, we, will, we will get a presentation from the, uh, the field guys, I think, are they? They are coming, huh? and they will tell you about how these things work but they will make sure that uh, he is behind his computer when they enter the house because uh, they need him to be logged on to the system because if he is not logged on to the system the first problem is that you have a login screen which you need to pass which is also a problem uh, on a running system because you so uh, they have ways of knowing that he's actually behind <coughs> the computer and then they will get in the house as quick as they can and uh, get in from behind the computer and get on his computer while he's still uh, logged on. So you, you don't have that problem. But then you have the Windows computer, it's running. <coughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to plug in a USB stick and install some software, run some software from the USB stick? But then if you start that software, you're changing the system. Because the operating system will uh, load the system in, in the RAM memory. Maybe there's not enough RAM memory available. It needs to swap from memory out of the RAM onto the page file. Right? It's, that's it's all possible. Onto the disk. So as soon as you start using tools, you probably change the system. Ha! But now, in, in, in a court, uh, the, uh, the, the defense can say, well, but maybe the police planted that on there. I mean, we're, we're, I think it's moot. I think it's, uh, it, it won't succeed, but they will surely try. Because uh, in forensics, as you know with all the other forensics, the first thing they do is taking pictures and making sure that, that they can say, well, that this is the truth. This is how we found it. We didn't tamper with it. They put it in plastic bags. They put uh, gloves on so that they don't change it. I mean, uh, if you have some blood spatter somewhere, uh, the, the police is not going to uh, cut 
uh, some uh, some orange or something uh, above the crime scene. And oops, I cut my finger. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, uh, well, probably most of it is not mine. I mean, uh, doesn't doesn't work like that. I mean, you, you will contaminate uh, the city. That's what they will say. But that is what the defense will say. By <coughs> by. By sticking your USB stick into the system, you're contaminating the system. You're contaminating the RAM. So now we cannot trust whatever you found. Oh, sure, you found this. Oh, sure, you found that. Who says you didn't plan? Maybe your USB stick was infected. So it's a, it's a difficult thing in court. So uh, obtrusive, uh, untrusted environment. I mean, the other the other side is also true. I mean. The defense can say, well, uh, you put your USB stick in, my, in the system of my client, and uh, of the defendant, and you infected the system and you contaminated the material. But the other thing could also be true, that when you have forensic tools and you put your stick in the system, maybe the system is so intelligent that it can see that, and it can say, wait a minute, that looks like a forensic tool. Maybe I'm going to infect it <laughs> and change the tool or something, or try to uh, mess with how it works. And this is true. I mean, there is a there's a backdoor on Windows machines. There's a USB stick that they that is available to the police, which the police could use to uh, do forensics on a on a on a Windows machine. But somehow, the word got out that this uh, maybe because of people like me. Telling, um, but, but the word is out. So I mean, but they have this uh, stick. The word got out that this stick exists, and there is uh, on the internet there's a software to protect yourself from this uh, forensic uh, tool, which of course you would like. I mean, because you don't want a backdoor in your system. Um, but as you will hear from the field guys, more and more these people uh, that. Uh, that are in circles of, of doing malicious things like uh, child pornography, they learn how to defend themselves against these, because they learn, you can bet that all the others that didn't get caught in this, uh, in this child pornography case, that are somehow linked to this case or in that network, they try to find out whatever they can about how they found him and what they did when he was captured and what mistakes he made so that he's now in prison. And uh, so they tried to learn. And you saw that there was a documentary later about uh, female uh, uh, pedophiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was scary because uh, they, there was this, 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 this reporter, and she, you still have seen yeah. it. And uh, what was scary is that you could see that they gave, that she immediately started giving tips on how to stay out of out of the uh, how to prevent from being found by the police and what you need to do so that they cannot. Well, and this this is a big problem. It's it's a it's a cat and mouse game again, of uh, of attack and defense. So you are also dealing with an untrusted environment. So you have no clue what you what you are up against, and there might be a lot of software that. Maybe as soon as you put your USB stick in there, it starts wiping things, or it starts uh, uh, logging off. There's, there's, there's so many ways of uh, tricks that they use to... Uh, uh, because they know this. I mean, they know that their key is in the RAM memory, and uh, they need to make sure that as soon as they get caught, that as soon as possible the key gets out of the RAM memory. Because if the key is out of the RAM memory, before it gets caught by the, by the, by the police or by law enforcement, then uh, the law enforcement might have a big problem proving their case because they cannot get to the data. So this is uh, another problem. Not repeatable. I mean, I have a system. Let's say I'm able to make a copy or I do some forensics on it. I find the key. Well, maybe the key is, is, is not, the, uh, not the right example. What if I had some data in the memory, like a, like a webcam screen, which uh, somehow got there uh, in a way that I cannot capture it 
uh, over the network because for whatever reason. Uh, but I, I can't find, I, find, I mean, maybe as a police officer, I'm watching it right now. The, the video, how do I take a copy of it? Well, I could take a picture, of course, but what if uh, for some reason I could not take a, a picture of it? How do I make a, a, a copy of it? How do, and how do I prove in court that uh, that, that is the actual <coughs> copy that I made? Because as you, uh, as you will, for those who watch TV, all these forensic uh, cases on TV, you always see, or always, it's, it's often that the, uh, that the defense would like to have their own uh, specialist look at the, uh, at, at, at the proof. And they say, well, this is the murder weapon, huh? this is the knife or whatever, and this is the knife and we found, uh, we found the blood and we found the, uh, the fingerprints. And then that's, that's our expert says this. They say, well, we have our expert, and we would also like to have a look at it. And then they get the knife as well, and they look at the knife. Okay, is, the, is it the depth of the cut, and is this the knife? Oh, no, look, this is, uh, this is more like a sword, and it's, uh, it's only a small cut. This sword could never have made that cut, or I don't know. Or, or, or the, the defendant uh, is, is a short person and he stabbed him in the heart and it would not be possible to do it from up there. It's no way you can do that. And, but then you need to prove, you need to have the evidence. And uh, with RAM, it's gone. I mean, it's only dead. How do you prove it? And you cannot make a picture. I mean, it's, it's not tangible. Is that the English word? Uh, so, here you see the analysis is practically done at the moment that you acquire it. It's, it's instantly. I mean, I'm looking at it, and this is the analysis, and then it's gone. And how do I prove that it was actually there? This is, this is, uh, this is definitely a, a point. Okay, memory forensics. If we, uh, here is, uh, we have a, a, a study done by uh, Fagemar Farmer and I uh, looked at how uh, volatile is data. And you see that the uh, register data within the CPU, of course, is uh, one of the most volatile places in the computer, uh, of course. The main memory, again, pretty volatile. Then uh, network, bless you, processes, and then the drive and the backup, and uh, of course a printout or a CD are, uh, they last much longer. Acquisition is done in an untrusted environment, bad thing. We would like to do the analysis in a trusted environment. That, that's what we prefer, if we can. Um, so that the analysis is not under control of the target OS. Because if, if it is, then um, it might not be reliable. Um, analysis should be repeatable. Acquisition, of course, with uh, RAM is not. This is what we would like to go for, but sadly this is not always possible. And, as you already said, the goal might be to get the password out of the memory for some encryption. <coughs> this is typically, uh, this is very often, this is the goal of law enforcement. That uh, you have some, some data encrypted, which a lot of people do, that are involved in <coughs> malicious uh, things. They have the data encrypted. It might be difficult to decrypt it. Might be, depending on uh, how you did it. But uh, uh, the easiest way to get to it is just get the password or get the key uh, while it's still in the round. And, it's, uh, and also with uh, proof, this is not so much a point because if I have the key, I can do my, uh, my static analysis on the, on the disk. And that's all repeatable. Uh, so, uh, with this, and, and uh, all I need is the password. I mean, this is, yeah, this is not a big issue in court. In the Netherlands, or even uh, uh, by law, you must give up your password, which is funny because uh, if you don't, you go to jail. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you have. Uh, a, a disk full with uh, ex uh, explicit uh, data uh, for which you can go to uh, prison for life. It might be uh, a better option to just uh, keep
keep your mouth shut and go to jail for a few days huh? for not giving your password. It's, uh, it, it, it's logic that I don't completely understand. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer or anything. Um, how do we get to the, to the data? Software based can be cheated. It's unreliable. That's what I said, with the USB stick, if I have to install software, it's, it's very easy to, for the whole system to prevent, prevent me from getting the, the data, to detect whether I, I, I'm trying to get the data and, and booby trap the system, but that's a difficult thing. And software-based violates also the forensic principle of altering the evidence, because I will load my software into the memory that is the same memory that I'm trying to do uh, my research on. It's like having a pool of blood from a, from a murder scene and put a little bit of my own blood in there as well so that I can do better research on it. I mean, it's, it's because I have the memory with tasks and now I'm going to in inject my own task as well in the pool, in the memory to do forensics on, the, on that same memory. So I'm infecting my own uh, pool. Hardware-based is harder to fool. It's, it's not impossible. It's harder and it's more reliable. Hardware-based does not alter the evidence. But there might be race conditions. Uh, for example, with cash. And that, well, we will get into that now. We have... Uh, a CPU. This is, uh, I don't know, 8086, I think. No, no, this is, this is, that, that's from the uh, 6502 or something, 6502 or something. This is probably the 8086, and this guy, this is definitely the 8086. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can see a lot of uh, electrical pins here, and we see that there's a lot of uh, AD pins. AD pins, pins means that they are they have two users. They are both the address pins and the data pins. Uh, we have uh, two what we call buses uh, on a system. Um, I'm switching to the next uh, slide. Here would be the CPU. And the CPU needs to, uh, the CPU is like the, the brain of the computer, the heart, <coughs> I don't know what you want to call it. It's what, what makes a computer a computer. But it cannot operate by itself. It needs some, uh, some other, uh, other uh, components to uh, function. So we have the CPU. This is the most important part of the computer. And the computer has uh, two main allies in, the, in its... Uh, in a scheme, and that is uh, the RAM memory, and the RAM memory is 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 it's, it's little notebook, the CPU's little notebook, because the CPU does uh, instructions on data. So the the uh, and that's the von Neumann von Neumann architecture that we use. Let me say, um, I have a CPU, and the CPU takes its own instructions from the RAM memory automatically. Wow, magic. With a instruction pointer, program counter, it just knows this is my next instruction, this is my next instruction, this is my... So it automatically takes the instructions from the memory uh, because it doesn't have enough memory inside. If we go back, then we can see that uh, this is probably, uh, these are, uh, I don't think there's memory, but if there would be memory in there, it would look like this. I mean, it takes up a lot of space, memory. So, uh, actually, this might be memory, but in the form of the uh, registers, uh, the registers. But it takes up a lot of space, memory. So, I, there's just not enough room on the chip to store a lot of data and or instructions. So that's why we have a separate component in my, uh, in my computer, in the computer, 
which stores the instructions and data. And the CPU just automatically takes the instructions from the RAM, maybe does some processing, maybe on data that it also took from the RAM, and maybe sometimes it puts the results back in the RAM. But it has no real memory to speak of of itself. That's all here. And because it is such an important part of the CPU, it's very close to the CPU, because the further it's away from the CPU, the slower it will go. Think about uh, DSL or ADSL at home. If you live very close to the DSL uh, switch, you have high speed internet, or at least uh, uh, it's reasonable fast. And if you live uh, very far from the switch, it's very slow. You click on something and uh, it, uh, it comes. Same here. Another thing which is very close because there's a lot of data is your video card. And that's because currently, <coughs> in the old days, we had uh, we had simple video with text. Text Adventures, Zork. And, uh, what else did we have? Good text adventures, uh, Arne. I'm sure you know a few. Um, but now we have the, the full HD screens, maybe two, maybe three screens with uh, first person shooter, Halo. And, and what's, the, what's the big one now? Yeah. Not Halo, huh? it's the other one. Call of Duty. Yeah? Call of Duty. Call of Duty, yeah. Call of Duty. Battlefield, no, but I think Call of Duty, Battlefield is not that good, is it? I mean, with their graphics. Mm. It's a bit disappointing. <laughs> That's good. Battlefield, okay. I thought Call of Duty was far more realistic. No? No, no, no. no. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. But because we want that incredible graphics at full speed, that means a lot of data it needs to go back and forth from the processor, from the RAM, to the processor. So that, that's why all these components are close together and they're all linked to each other uh, with a uh, switch. And this is the switch. See, and it has a heat sink because it's, it's hot from, uh, from all the data that goes uh, through it. Um, and it's called the North Bridge. Then all the other stuff is slow compared to, uh, to the RAM and the video and it's on the it's connected to the south bridge the south bridge is connected to the north bridge and all the other slower stuff like your hard disk and your mouse and uh, that is all, uh, for the for the computer is that that's all very slow and that's all connected uh, through this chip doesn't need a heat sink because it's uh, practically no data going through uh, if compared to what, what goes uh, uh, through the uh, switch. <coughs> okay. And how does it uh, communicate? It communicates using two main, well, three. I have to be complete. It communicates through uh, three, what we call buses. And a bus is nothing but a set of wires that belong together. And uh, the first uh, group is uh, what we call the control bus. And it's all this crap over here. Uh, uh, selecting uh, logic on the motherboard. So whether I want to communicate with that or with that, is it a read or a write? Because read, write, I'm sure it's there. Yeah, read, write, see? So if, uh, if, there is, uh, is, if there's no power on this one, I like that, there's no, no power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very low voltage, so then you need to use your tongue huh? to, uh, to feel if there's any voltage on it. That's what we used to do with batteries. Huh? Is it still full? Uh, no, it's empty. And, then, uh, and you would trick your friends, huh? because you would do it just like you would. Uh, no, it's empty. It feels empty. It's <laughs> full. Uh, but with your fingers, you don't really feel. Uh, but with your tongue, uh, a lot more. Um, and this is the same. I mean, if you feel with your finger, it's 5 volt. You but if you put your tongue on it, I can, uh, I can vouch, you will know, feel. I can also uh, vouch that uh, what you could also use, which is more difficult, is your earlobe. I know this because uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, we had a little modem, and of course, for some reason, it didn't have a box anymore. It was just a print, 
and it had a uh, 220 volts uh, main on it. And of course, that was all the way on the edge. It was two plugs, and then it went through a little transformer. It was all 10, uh, 12 volts after that. But there were two pins with 220 volts on it uh, to the main. And for some, I don't know, uh, <laughs> some plug or something got unplugged. So I, I needed <laughs> to get it in there. So uh, the, the plug in there. And uh, apparently, I held my earlobe on these little <laughs> two uh, thingies. And uh, yeah. So uh, I, ca I can uh, tell from my own experience, it's not only the tongue, your earlobe also works pretty well <laughs> on detecting uh, current. Uh, yeah, and I remember it was in the middle of the week, it was cold, but uh, I didn't need any hat or anything. I, was, uh, so, uh, I had a little fry in there. Uh, but it's fine, it's okay. It's all part of growing up. Uh, so if there's no volt on this line, it means we're reading. That's, that's a control. The control bus tells all sorts of control information to the board and it's connected to all sorts of what? Then uh, it means if we connect this to the memory, <coughs> it means we're only looking at the memory. <coughs> it's like uh, when you go to a store, we need to now just look. So there's, there's no fault. If we put power on this line, if we feel power, it means we want to write to the memory. So now, if you put some data on these lines, and this is this is a binary thing. So if we put it starts here, zero, one, two, and this is a sixteen bit sixteen? Yeah. This is a sixteen bit uh, processor. So it would go from, from D zero data zero to <laughs> D fifteen. Data fifteen, which is zero to fifteen, sixteen data bits. And it's a binary number. So if I want to write uh, 1000100101 I don't know, into the RAM, I would put power, nothing, 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 power, nothing, nothing, it's binary. And I put power here, and it would put it in the RAM. Where would it put it in the RAM? I would have to put that on the bus first. Um, I'm sure there is a selection pin for whether it is. Uh, we cannot see what these are. That's probably. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Probably it's uh, interlacing, but I think there must be another line as well to, to say which is which. But the address lines, this has a 20-bit uh, a address bus, so we have 20 pins for the address, which makes up to uh, uh, one megabyte. I didn't talk it, I know this is a one megabyte computer. So, uh, but that, that means two to the power of 20 is one megabyte. And first I put the number of which byte in the RAM I would like to write or read. And then right after that, it's a clock based system, huh? it's, it's every yeah, it's, it's my clock. One, two, three, four. There's a little clock generator in there, and it generates a pulse every so many times. Huh? And uh, so the first pulse, we see something on the address bus, and it says the, uh, the address number 1001100. Okay, then the RAM gets connected. That byte gets connected to these pins, these 16 data pins, and then if this is low, we get the data from the RAM to the chip, and if this pin is high, if it has power, whatever is on these pins will be written into the RAM. It's as simple as that. Get some solder and uh, make your own PC. Uh, you to, that's, the, that's the lab for this afternoon. No. Uh, but it's not that difficult to create a computer. It's really not that difficult. It's a pretty uh, simple process. Of course, it gets more difficult if we want it faster and with uh, all this kind of stuff. But at the basic level, it's still pretty <coughs> understandable. Okay, now, we want to get there. Everything is connected to the bus. So if we, uh, if we have a better look at it, how this looks, we can see that 
basically everything is connected to this bus, to this, to this chip, to the CPU. So if I somehow manage to get on the bus, I can do the same thing the processor can. So if, for example, I put a card in here, I can see exactly what's in the RAM. I can just read the RAM. I can do what the processor does. Put zero 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 read, and I read by zero. Next step, zero zero for zero 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 one. No, other way around. One zero 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 zero, and I get the next one. Zero one zero zero zero. I get the next one. One one zero zero zero. I get the next one, and so on. Till one 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 one. Last one, last back. So I could do that, and I could read the whole RAM. I have to make sure that the system doesn't interfere with me. How can I stop the processor? Is there an easy way to stop the processor? There is. Very easy say, way. I could, for example, well, uh, there's two things that I could do. I could short the, the clock. There's a clock here. Uh, I'm sure there's a clock. Here's the clock. I could just short it. Just, just put it to ground. And if I do that, it stops. Because the way the processor works is it gets a little pulse on this pin every so many times. And every time it gets a pulse, it does something. And if I put the pulse to, to, the, to, the, to the ground, it stops. And the processor stops. I mean, it doesn't, nothing it stops. Perfect. But there's more things I could do. I could, uh, is there, I don't know if, that, if this system, I think this system also has that line on the bus where you could uh, claim the bus. So you can say to the processor, shut up. It's, but there's a, uh, the modern processors all have it. They have a little shut up uh, line. And if I, uh, if I put power on the shut up line, it will stop saying anything on the bus. Perfect. And then I can put it uh, Another thing I could do is just, uh, 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 there's a, usually a halt line. Halt. See? So if I put power on this line, just 5 volt, in this case 5 volt. If I put 5 volts on this pin, same thing, stops. There are many things that I could do to stop the processor. And this is all on the bus. So I can do that, well not the clock. The clock might not be, well, uh, depends on your system. Um, but typically all that information is on the bus. So if I have a card in here, I could stop the processor, kill it, and read the memory. I could do that. Of course, I would have. I need to have physical access to this uh, slot. And as you will hear from the field guys, sometimes they put uh, explosives in the computer. They have found it, so, or uh, because they don't like it when you put uh, a card in there. So they put a little uh, little fireworks in there. Surprise! Yeah. Surprise. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's a dangerous. Still want to be be all enforced. Uh. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if there's other ways to get in there. We could do it with an acquisition card, as you can here see over here. Uh, this, that's this little. Uh, and these are, this is a paper that you can read and it tells you how they did this and that it works. But there's better ways. There's another paper from, uh, I don't know, probably a Polish person, I think. Rutkowska, I don't know. Uh, and um, it, yeah, of course you can go through the PCI. But you can also go through uh, the 1394. And 1394 is also known as Firewire. Firewire is, has the full bus. So what I can do with Firewire, I have access to the bus, and uh, I can just go 
into the ramp. And, uh, and they tried to protect themselves from it. And they were a little bit successful. Not much. The modern controllers, so now we are talking about this chip, huh? This chip. This chip is programmable. So you can look up how it, and nowadays it's usually uh, inside the same package as your CPU. So this chip is gone. If you look at your motherboard, it's not there anymore. And why is it not there? Because it's, it's with your CPU, usually not on the same die, because it takes up too much space, but in the same package. So uh, the, the CPU is in a, in a little plastic box, and in that plastic box they can put two or three or four chips if they like. Huh? Mm -hmm. it's, it's close together, because the closer this is together, the faster it is. And it's, it's, uh, ex again, like the DSL, uh, and, all, and all of it, and, uh, well, like DSL. <laughs> 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 it's too difficult. Um, okay, so what they did was they tried to program this uh, chip so that it's uh, more difficult to get in there from the outside because uh, there's two different ways of getting there. And you can say, well, if you come from this side, you cannot get to the RAM or you cannot get everything. It's programmable. It's, 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 a, it's a very interesting thing. If you want to do some research in this, this is definitely. Uh, very interesting. You should read this paper, and uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. But it's very low level. They uh, they they uh, uh, they got that far that because of reprogramming of the memory controller, they got the system to hang when they tried to uh, to get in there. That's what they succeeded in doing, but. They say more research needs to be done, uh, whether there are more effective ways and is there are ways to, uh, to circumvent this. I don't have the picture here, but uh, it's also possible to get uh, to other I.O. on this uh, on the bus. So, for example, well, we're now talking about RAM memory. But, of course, if I'm on the bus, I have also perfect access to any other devices that are on the bus as well. Like um, drives, disk drives, I can see, I can communicate with them as well. <coughs> with all other I.O. And I can get to RAM within the I.O. Because, for example, the hard disk itself it's not only a hard disk, it also has RAM. And a lot of cards and, uh, and devices and I.O. and uh, uh, yeah, devices and IO in your system have little RAM in them. And you can get there through the bus or through this chip by reprogramming this chip. And you can fake the chip, if you, can, if you manage to reprogram the chip, then Basically what you can do is you can map any part of memory to any part of memory or I.O. So maybe the operating system does not allow you to get into the memory of certain I.O. But it allows you to get into the memory of your own task. Ha, but if I reprogram this chip, I can move the I.O. memory onto the memory space of my task memory. And I read and write into my task memory, but in reality, I'm reading and writing into the I.O. So there's so many attacks possible by programming this chip. This is whew, dangerous stuff. Um, yeah, you see, I can map I.O. or ROM or RAM. I can do a lot of nasty things by reprogramming that thing. Basically, by reprogramming this, I can I, I have access to <coughs> anything memory related on the system. And I can map it however I want it. Uh, 
bad thing. Uh, yeah, I can uh, I can redirect I/O reads and writes. That's what they say here, which means I can. It basically means the mapping of memory. Mm -hmm. I have a nice video. I hope it works. Let's see. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's an audio. Does it, does it not have audio? No, then I guess I'll have to do the audio myself. Uh, what you see here is, a, is an Apple laptop. And it is locked, as you can see. It has, a, it has a password. But here we have a Windows machine. And on this Windows machine, we will install some software that is able to... Uh, to uh, analyze the, the RAM of the uh, Apple. And that's the software. <coughs> and what we do is we connect the Windows machine to the Apple machine through FireWire. And with it, it has direct access. It, basically, we all have to cut this out. Basically, Apple is now Windows bitch. Uh, uh, Windows can do with the Apple whatever it wants, because it has full control of the bus on the Apple machine. And as you can see, I don't know what's happening here. I think it's now, uh, oh, it, it, it already captured the, the RAM. And it, uh, it found the password. Oh, it already captured the password. And now it, it will enter that password on the Apple. And we're in. So it took, what did it take, 20 minutes to show? How long it took to find it? Oh, here. Uh, no, I can see it here. It took uh, almost eight minutes to find the password. And that's only because it probably didn't know where it was, where it was stored. So it, uh, the, the, the trick that, it's the same trick that virus scanners use. There's a little, uh, uh, how do you call that? A, uh, I mean, virus scanners, they use a, to detect the virus, they use a signature. Thank you, Armin. Uh, uh, <laughs> I saw you about it, so yeah. Uh, they, they, did a, they do a signature, and uh, a signature is nothing but a series of bytes. And it knows the signature of where to find the password, and it's just scanning the memory, and it will find, oh, there it is. And that's the password. <coughs> But if you know where it is, you don't even need to scan, you can just take it. This is exactly, but then software-wise, this is exactly how they did the target attack, where they stole the credit card thing. Uh, they scanned the memory, and, oh, uh, credit card, ta-da! Uh, uh, okay. Windows has a uh, crash dump, and a crash dump could be pretty interesting. You can get a lot of information out of crash dump. It shows which tasks are running. It shows uh, stack information. It shows some uh, RAM information. Mind you, when it makes a, uh, a crash dump, it destroys parts of the page file. And the page file is like uh, a hard disk, a file on the hard disk with extra RAM. And your total RAM memory it's the virtual memory. I think I have some slides on virtual memory. But in virtual memory, the, the actual memory that is used is, might be larger than the actual RAM that you have in your system. And, part, and the part of the RAM that you don't actually have is stored on disk in what we call a page file. And this page file or swap file or how you want to call it, there's several names for it, this swap file is, is partly destroyed when you have a, uh, a, a crash dump. There's a lot of data that doesn't get included in your uh, crash dump. For example, DMA data, which is data of, about the bus. Uh, AGP data, again, about the bus. Uh, BIOS data, also interesting. And there's a high degree of uh, contamination from <coughs> making the crash while it is making the crash dump, <coughs> it changes a lot of the, the data. What we, what we started out with, that if I do forensics on the memory, 
with a tool, I contaminate the memory itself. And you see that here because the tool is making the first time. I have a small video about uh, yeah. And, uh, the about the Windows debugger? Of, uh, in I think it's a, uh, basically a French person. Uh, has support to debug.net applications. It's a small video and, it's and it shows very useful because, uh, Windows debug, debug, which is an awesome tool. Applications. And so you don't need to deobfuscate them first. Uh, and what he will show is how to get a password or that uses, uh, passwords. <laughs> Uh, you have a deja vu from. Uh, you can uh, <laughs> basically crack this. That's well, okay. much easier than using the reflector. He, he made right, a little so, tool. Uh, I'm using the same. Uh, crack me here. Yeah, it's a, I used it's a password. What about oh, and I forgot to mention last time. And uh, if you have the right you password, it will work well. It's, it's, it's a demo. You, okay. can, you should run it. And he will show because how you never to get know if it's malicious through or not. that. But exactly. anyway, let's get going here. This is how a lot of right, software gets so, hacked. We have to find and put a key in. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> just, uh, open the what they do is uh, flip the if, and if you flip the if, as long as you right, don't so put in the right key, uh, it will work. Um, so instead, instead of saying, oh, uh, wrong password, it will say, oh, now that's the right password. It switches but, uh, to if. Then. I might make a video on how to set it up as well, but uh, not right now. Okay, so never mind these. Uh, if there's some error when you start it, most of What you did here is uh, loading the uh, application. Right, so and the first thing you want to type is uh, X, uh, the, uh, S, X, E, the, the areas in RAM uh, and where the application is loaded. And this is a .NET uh, uh, you application. You type everything here, so if so it's a it uh, .NET support for now, the uh, application or, uh, itself, you type CLL, and it uses one, two, three, three four, four, four DLLs, or which are all loaded. Because in this case, I'm using CLL because it's a fourth window application. And uh, what this command does is basically uh, puts a breakpoint uh, right break at the start of the application. So uh, All of you, I did similar yeah, things, when you no? start the application, now it's going to break point. And I, you I can sadly, do I didn't see his lesson, right. but I think he did so the same if you similar uh, things. Like when you set breakpoints, and, go, and so a breakpoint is where you want to right. stop. Let's see, uh, huh? we get a, a break here at clr.dlo. And uh, this is a good sign. And a dot net, know, he uh, says, any dot net application uh, is easy to break at the uh, CLR, also, uh, DLL. No, we need to know because that's a starting source, point uh, for the application, so the we, we break on that CLR. And All right, so we it's a the, good start uh, to, uh, SOS to break. CLR. I also like to type load SOS. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but uh, I just do it. It doesn't hurt to do it, so... Uh, <coughs> Right. Uh, now we have loaded the S SOS uh, extension. We press the uh, G again to start the application. Yeah, G you runs it and it stops. And we see we have an oh. application run here and uh, the, uh, the debugger in the background. And uh, we're just going to test here what's happened when you press login. All right, so we get a message box that you failed. And uh, if there's a message box in the application, that's a uh, good sign because it's easy to break points and uh, easy to pinpoint where you want to uh, debug. So uh, we're going to put a breakpoint on uh, uh, message box. So uh, type uh, BP for breakpoint, message box W. That is awesome. I don't know if any of you did any uh, uh, .NET programming. Right, sorry about that. But you will recognize but yeah, the message box uh, W, that's what you, you can use to get a message box. Uh, and you can actually break point because it's uh, uh, will list all the, uh, like threads Java, in the application. it is uh, by and code, case, and the actual uh, uh, one, uh, uh, this method is the names are still in there. So you can actually break point uh, on the method name. Uh, if awesome. it's STA, it usually means it's a Windows form. <laughs> uh, so this is what we're looking for. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the MTA front is, but uh, yeah, we're going to go for the STA, so it's going to jump to the thread uh, ID 0. That's right, you can see here 8. And uh, you do this squiggly thing, 0 and S. Right, so now you see it's changed down here, so we're at uh, thread 0. And uh, now when we're in the manage thread, we can type out our breakpoint. So type up uh, BP, message box W. First, he was uh, trying to send a breakpoint on the wrong thread. Uh, so now you see board. we have a breakpoint with the uh, message box API here. 
And uh, yeah, so basically the next time there's message blocks in the application, uh, it's gonna break and uh, we can do some debugging so we know where we are. All right, so um, we can press G again to make the application go. And if you press login here again, you see we get a breakpoint zero hit. So uh, the breakpoint was hit here. And uh, now we can uh, view the <coughs> call stack of the application. This like is cool. See our stack. Make sure we're in first uh, in the same thread here. The this is the call stack. Otherwise, uh, this won't be possible. And yeah. this, okay, you will right. see this, so uh, this when you get an error stack. in Java. Remember, and this you get is the same stuff. All methods or functions that I've seen. Uh, and this is the last. So, uh, uh, the, the last method called, call and this is the first method. Right? And uh, the first program main at the bottom. This is the start with main, and in main we have something called and and it and called more and more and more and more. So this is the first call. So now we can see the whole and, uh, structure the last, of so the application. Uh, there are some this, strange calls here. That it you reveals a lot of information about, about the it's application. It's just some uh, internal. And here we see the message box. If you go a little further down here, you see this. It's called to messagebox.show, and uh, this is what we're looking for because uh, when you press the, the function button, it shows or the message box. that we want to see. In this so case. this is probably where that message was shown, and uh, the method right below it should be the uh, here here PT login click. So uh, uh, this is so yeah, for some reason they got an error up here, but uh, let's just never mind that. Right here it works. Fine. I just typed in the CLR stack again to get the same list here. So right before the message box show, we get a uh, ETL login click here. And this is the method we're looking for because, uh, yeah, this is most likely our crack me uh, Here's the instruction pointer. button here. Alright, so uh, let's copy the uh, IP and type. Yeah, this IP is the, the button MP. login click. So what and he does now is he goes here. to the method that is linked and you to get the some uh, information about click. the method. You can get the name, uh, class, uh, token, method table, MD token. It shows the handle and, and things uh, like this. Is, we're now delving into the data structures, structures of, uh, of Windows and of the .NET It's gone platform. through the, the JIT engine, so it's been but converted to a native method. But uh, that, that's just basically what we uh, what we want is the, the method ID. The method, the method ID, because so with the method ID, address, we can get the code. We can uh, the method. get the IL code of the uh, method. So uh, you do that. IL is the .NET IL. version of uh, bytecode. Uh, the method description. Intermediate language, bytecode. Right, language. so we can see the method file here, and uh, it looks like we got the right method here. Because and here's the code. The, uh, text of the click, the button click, the button click, and it takes pass control, and calls the verified credentials. You're in. You uh, failed? Yeah, I went over this last time, so uh, just last, uh, watch the last video if you want to know what this actually does. <laughs> right, so this is the um, uh, jump we're looking for here. Uh, mm -hmm. Because this is, yeah, what decides if it's going to be you failed. Yeah, what we could do is analyze this so function. What we're looking for is to change this to false status. Because that's probably where so we find the password. Just gonna say you're in but he doesn't do that. Credentials in. He just uh, takes this. Uh, we're gonna modify this, this the if. negative There's code if here. The method. So to get the metric code, you just type uh, u, but and then say we need the, the actual uh, code there, so that we can alter the right, if. I'm, so gonna, I'm not gonna go through this uh, instruction by instruction. This is not the I/O, but this is the actual some of this stuff is machine language or assembly language of, of this code. method. But uh, we can see and here, here we can see the, uh, the, the so I let's see eight we're around here. Three eighty six code. code. And we're gonna uh, look for the jump. If we follow which is here. here. Okay, here we see uh, you your cannot really see it, but it's the this. jump so not right equal. That, there should be a, here it says a jump. You're in. Let's see. And you're yes, failed. There's a jump if not equal. Here's here. the if and here and it says so if it's not equal, change. We then say Jump uh, because uh, that's the you uh, fail of GNA. and if it's uh, right, so if it's uh, equal then it goes through and the, it says uh, you're in. The, uh, so if it's here. not equal if and the password is not equal a, uppercase a it will jump the over the you are in and now we're and in it will the jump edit to mode so we can uh, actually edit the uh, so uh, instruction here what he's going to do now is change this 
machine code from jump if not equal to be jump equal. So what he does, if, if we type the correct password, it says you failed. And if you type the wrong password, it will ignore it. And it will say you're in. That's what he's doing right now. And you can see how easy it is, because he takes the memory address of the jump. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, see, it's it takes the memory the address. So uh, basically, we reverse the if statement. Oh, he already did it. The native program. <laughs> so but he took the memory address and he says, put there the, in the machine code or the assembly equal. And then just type in He's going to do it again. Oh, sorry. It's, it's the uh, breakpoint. We hit breakpoint, so we can, we can actually remove the breakpoint. Right? Just to go just, uh, again. Like PC, zero. Uh, PC and the ID of the uh, breakpoint here. And then press G again to go. Boom. And it says you're in. It says you're in. So, so basically, as long as we don't type the, the right password. Reverse the simple if statement. Now with we're in. The wind, uh, so there's wind a lot of possibilities. And, uh, to, uh, there's some stuff use I, the can show you. I can show you. All uh, sorts of nice things. For example, finding out passwords. And what he's going to do now is even DSO. more, even better. Get, uh, <laughs> basically, an uh, object. Object dump here. He did, he, uh, he did actually, an let's object dump. Show you that. Let's push the uh, break on this push again. And uh, let's go. And hit it again. Alright, so now if we type the uh, ESO again. So these are here. all the objects this that are currently the loaded that in, the, uh, in the .NET platform. Uh, this is the username. And, this and is you, the uh, and, uh, if, if the code is wrong, so it will just show you the your here. encryption keys you and stuff like that right here. You don't even need to but in this case, there's not to get into the here. memory. You can just Some read the it. message when you press the button. And, uh, you if the key is somewhere so as a string, it's not much use as right it's now. Right it can be very useful sometimes, uh, especially in the. Uh, well, um, what other tools could you use for memory acquisition? You could use uh, Day Day. DD, it's a tool for uh, in Linux, Linux and uh, Unix, used for all sorts of uh, uh, raw dumps from a disk, but also a memory. You can make uh, copies. In uh, in Linux and Unix, there's no difference between the RAM or uh, a disk in the operating system. It, it is the uh, the whole RAM <coughs> memory is part of the standard. Uh, operate, it, it's, it's part of the standard uh, directory tree, so you can just get it as you would a file. Data Dumper is a program. Uh, PM Dump is a program that you can use under Windows to dump the memory of a running process, or a Process Dumper dump the uh, Windows 32 memory of a running process. So there are different tools that you could use. These are all user level. Not very reliable because uh, the impact can be significant because it's a user level process. Fuzzy snapshot, snapshot because the system is running. So I cannot copy the whole RAM in one go. I mean, it's not, I have to start with byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three, byte four, byte five. And there could be some computers have maybe. One megabyte of RAM, whoa! Or maybe one gigabyte of RAM, or maybe sixteen gigabyte of RAM. Who has sixteen gigabytes of RAM? I'm so jealous. Sixteen gigabytes. I think I think I have eight. Uh, um, sixteen. Um, but you see, that takes a long time. Even on your probably i7 uh, with my Core 2 Duo. <laughs> Tip, get a real job. <laughs> uh, and don't go in law enforcement because they don't pay either. I mean, uh, I've worked for the police. It's, uh, don't do it for the money. Uh, easy access to drugs. No, no, oh, we have to cut this out. No. Uh, the. Um, uh, the system is running. I take a byte for byte copy, and by the time um, I've copied the first bytes, then further on things are going to change. And so 
the copy that I get is might not be consistent. It might not make sense <coughs> because it's it's I cannot freeze the system. Not with a uh, user level application. These uh, uh, these papers prove that. Rootkits, big problem. I don't think we saw this video. Where uh, uh, did we see this video? No. This is a video about a uh, rootkit, and it shows you uh, how. Um, well, it is, this is hacking. So this is uh, they, they infected the system, but the, the idea is the same. So what they do is they infected a system uh, with a backdoor, and the system automatically reports itself into uh, the IRC channel. <laughs> there it is. And uh, this system says, I've been hacked. I'm your bitch. Oh, again, we need to. Uh, I'm your. I'm Slave. <laughs> Slave. Oh, oh, it's something else I cannot say in America. Ah, uh, uh, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yours. Eh? Uh, I'm yours. What would you like me to do? And you uh, can connect to it and you can say, well, here you go. And this, this is standard how you would do in a chat channel. Tell me something about yourself. Well, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a one CPU kind of person. <laughs> I have uh, two megs of uh, RAM, or no, three megs of clock. Mm, no, three gigs, 300, 300 megs of RAM, I don't know, difficult to see. And I run Windows 2000, and so on. So then it uh, downloads some tools to that system. Mind you, the, the system itself is totally unaware that this is happening. If you have uh, a person like uh, Robert M, who has the child porn uh, thing on his uh, computer, he would do this himself. He would put some software on there to uh, basically what a rootkit does is uh, hide the reality from uh, uh, from from others. Oh, sorry, it hides. It, it digs into the system. But now this is a this is a, a bad guy. Huh? <laughs> and it's uh, it's running on your computer and you don't know. And it's uh, downloading all sorts of stuff from the computer to uh, hack the uh, password. So it uh, runs a, a common prompt while you are playing uh, Halo. Huh? <laughs> Die, you... Uh, so you... Uh, uh, mother... Uh, <laughs> lover... something like that. Uh, huh? And uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the background, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bad guy is, uh, is starting the software, and it's about there now, and it takes a long time. But it just started the, the software, and the software is trying to decrypt the password of the administrator, and when bam, there it is, thank you, ma'am. So uh, we now have the uh, administrator password. That's nice because that's something we wanted. Then, what else is he going to do now? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's setting up a link now from uh, the hacker's computer to this computer. And as the field guys will tell you, they had this happen to them as they were investigating systems. So they were investigating the system, <coughs> oh, looking for whatever. And all of a sudden, oh, things happened. Because the owner of the system had this software installed so they could wipe the system from uh, remotely as the law enforcement. So now they have learned unplugging. <laughs> uh, well, let's live and learn. Live and learn. So let's see. So what he did was. Uh, he set up a, li a system because that, that computer might be hidden behind a firewall. <coughs> it's difficult to get to it, but now you make that hack system connect to you. So it says, hello, I'm here. What would you like to do with me? And, uh, oh, I know something I would like to do. I would like to install a rootkit on you. So, and that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, 
Well, let's see. He's now setting up the link. He downloaded the link, and he's, the software to set up the link. And he's now um, connecting to the hacker's computer from the hacked computer. Difficult part of it all is typing all the data, and then boom, and the connection has been made. And now he switches to his own computer. Switches to his own computer. This is a demo. This is set up a demo set. It's not real life. Okay, I hope. Checking and he's setting up a remote desktop over the link and ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. we now have a connection to the hack computer. Pretty awesome. And we know the password because we hacked the password. We can log on with the password. Ta -da. And we are logged on. And so far. This is just standard hack. But like I said, this is also what the, uh, the bad guys do. If you uh, don't protect your uh, system, that you would. Uh, Armin has seen that you, a lot of you started your uh, your virtual machines. Uh, because mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe there are, maybe there are similar things in there. Uh, also over a chat channel, isn't it? I think. It's also if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what he does is he checks the uh, program uh, uh, viewer, the process manager, and he checks the uh, he checks the, the, the open connections, and you can see that the connection is open and that the process is running. The process of the link, the process of the bad software, and the uh, and the link is active. You can see that. But now he's going to use a little tool, a little rootkit tool, to uh, to take a few of that, a little bit of that information out of the out of this list because it's a little bit of overkill. All that information, I mean, the owner doesn't really need to know that the link is active and he doesn't really need to know that uh, the, uh, the process, the malware is running. So he says, well, you don't need to mention this information in the task manager. This, this is fine. Let's keep it nice and neat. Let's not mention these. And connections, uh, this connection don't bother mentioning it. It's, it's okay. Just leave it out. So, two connections you want to leave out on the list. And it creates a little file, an executable. And if we run that executable, these processes and these links will disappear. Like magic. Rootkit disappears. He's not uploading it to his server so that he can uh, download it again on the obscure hack system. <coughs> so, now we're going to download it.
when it's downloaded. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Download. And if we now check, I think you will only check for connections, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, next step. And the connections are gone. That's our the process. This is a rootkit. So if a rootkit is installed on the system, it's very difficult to find the information. So, uh, <coughs> scary, huh? Okay, let's see. Out in slide. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I still have a lot of slides. Till what time do we have, uh, I One minute. One minute. I see. Okay. Let's see what is important. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit over time but uh, I will do it as quick as I can. So, applications that we could use, memory uh, DD, Windows Memory Toolkit, Memorize, NCase, Access Data, uh, KMTDD, HP Gary. These are all tools that are kernel level applications. So they run in, uh, at kernel level, they, are, they get a little bit lower into the chain, they have more, more control over the system, because they kind of hack the system in a way. Uh, but as you can see, these were tests done that uh, a live acquisition, even with DD or with uh, Windows Forensics Toolkit, this is the, the amount of RAM that was unchanged. So you see that about 25 to 30 percent of the memory, and this is uh, 256 megabyte, uh, has changed while you, you are doing the, the acquisition. So I'm doing the acquisition, and 25% of the acquisition is, is garbage, or garbage, it's changed while I was doing the acquisition. And with Windows Forensics Toolkit, it's even worse. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult task, the whole uh, acquisition. This uh, movie we are gonna skip. Then uh, another trick that they are using is cold boot. It's called cold boot. If I freeze the memory chips, the RAM chips, the memory uh, stays in there longer, up to hours. So what they do is they have a little, uh, well, they have this, uh, what's it called? Stickstop? Nitrogen? Nitro Liquid nitrogen in English. Uh, or, uh, or a little uh, spray can, which is very cold. And then they uh, uh, make the RAM extremely cold, and then maybe take it out and put it in a different system to read it, or uh, make the RAM extremely cold, reboot the system, and then do a memory dump, because the memory might still be in there for up to hours. But as it says, it looks promising, but at the moment, it's not very practical. But the, all these papers are about the cold boot, and they are able to get the data out of them. We have a, a bigger problem now, with SSD, because SSD is not like a normal disk. SSD works with uh, memory banks, and there is a there's a there's a management layer between what we think the SSD is and the actual storage on the SSD or the USB stick. So uh, the SSD is built up of banks. I am writing my file, and this file is put in these banks, <coughs> maybe like this. Now I put another file, and this file is also stored, maybe like this. The problem with uh, SSD is it can only delete complete banks, so I cannot delete half banks, that's not possible with SSD. So now if I delete this file, 
I want to delete this and I want to delete this. But the problem is I cannot delete either because uh, uh, because there's still data from others in there. So what will what will happen over time is that this data will be moved here automatically, and this, then this whole bank will be deleted. But that's something I have no control of. That's done by the management of the SSD. There's another problem with SSD. I can only write the banks a certain amount of time. So uh, some files never change. I have fantastic pictures on my computer, on my SSD. I, I cannot go into the contents because it's recorded, but uh, very good pictures. And, uh, and they, they never change. I mean, I wouldn't want to change them for uh, anything. But uh, there's other files, like uh, log files, that change continuously. So this, here is the picture, never changes, of nature. I can say that much. Uh, so I have a fantastic picture, never changes. And I have a log file that changes all the time. But now the management says, whoa, 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 whoa. <coughs> now this cell would get used too much. It has little counters of how much a cell gets written because it has a maximum of writes. So it, it writes it one time, it writes it a second time, and then it says, I've already used this cell twice for writing. So now I'm going to move this file here so that now we're going to write, now it's, it's more evenly divided. But this is not for files, this is on a block basis. Basic basis. So it could be that I have files where only part of the file are continuously written. And then that part gets moved all over the SSD. And the problem is that it's all, uh, how do you say that, it's all uh, proprietary. So the, all the chips are different. There's not a single way of doing this management. So for law enforcement, to just take the, the, the USB memory chips or your SSD chips and look at them because they can shave them off <coughs> and they can look at the data or read the data, take the chips out and read the data. But because they, have, they don't know what management uh, strategies are used and how, that, how the data is structured, on, it's very difficult. Because the same data could also be stored several times as you can see. On, so there's a lot of noise on these chips. So SSD is a real problem for law enforcement. The USB and the SSD is a real problem because of this, of the uh, management that is done. Okay, I have a few more slides, and uh, but this, this this can go quick because it's it's more or less uh, uh, information about papers that people found. The hibernation file, of course, Windows. If you on Windows or the Mac, you close it. It writes some some data to the disk to put the system to sleep. Hibernate, mind you, they cannot reproduce full RAM because they only store what they need to store to restore the system. But there might have been a lot of extra data in there from from the past that you don't necessarily need to restore to the system where you were. So. Uh, and there are tools, Sandman and Moonsouls, for example, to uh, uh, to analyze the hibernation file. Here's a, a slide about availability and uh, atomicity. So how uh, how how good can you uh, can you preserve the data? Uh, atomicity means that it is. Uh, that you can capture the data intact without <coughs> it changing while you are acquiring it. So you can uh, use a level applications. It's pretty easy to acquire the full uh, uh, the, the full content of a user level application, but it's very difficult to acquire the operating system uh, data intact. Recommended tools. Win 32DD, KNTDD, uh, FVSpons, Firewire, Python tools, uh, Cold Boot, with the, 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 the freezing of the chips. Um, analyzing, 
There's things like uh, grab win hacks, uh, hacks, hex editors, just watching at the memory. You can maybe do a string search or something. Be careful about Unicode. There's different uh, ways of coding text. Fragmentation, as with the SSD, the data might be fragmented over the memory, especially now with, uh, uh, with security against uh, uh, buffer overruns and buffer overflows. There's a lot of techniques involved to randomize uh, data more, or even uh, obfuscate. This is an actual C program. I know you all love it. Who wouldn't? Me too. Um, and this is an actual C program that does that, that is space invaders on, a, on an X Windows system. But as you can see, it's it's a little bit difficult to read. Not impossible for a true C programmer. Uh, oh, yeah, a, sure. But uh, now, even for a true C programmer, it's still uh, quite difficult to reach. Um, let's see. I had some information about Stuxnet, but I'm going to swap it because it tells a little bit about uh, uh, memory. Uh, how to get in systems, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, Stuxnet, we, uh, we can uh, skip that for now. I told you there's a lot of data structures in the operating system. This is an example of the Windows data structures. There's a lot. There's two good books. Windows uh, internals, very interesting. The uh, memory management unit, that's about uh, page paging. There's a little uh, uh, unit in your computer. It, it used to be a chip, now it's part of your CPU, that does the translation from, uh, from the logic address to your uh, physical address. And as we said, the, uh, every process has its own virtual memory, its virtual RAM, and the MMU plus the operating system translated to a uh, the, the, the RAM, the virtual RAM is divided into pages, so small pages, typically 4 kilobyte, 4K, and the MMU and the our operating system together translated to a uh, actual physical uh, RAM frame. And it is possible that not all pages are actually in RAM. It could be that some of the pages are in what we call the page file. And if the process requests a page which is now not loaded into the RAM, the MMU creates um, a page fault to the OS, and the OS will swap a page from the RAM into the page file, <coughs> put the one that it needs from the page file into the RAM, and then gives control back to the MMU, and, and it can access it. That's what happens. So there's, there's data in the page file as well, which makes it more difficult to get to the data. Um, this, is, this is how it's done, how the calculation is done, but that's better. That's, uh, that's not that necessary. We, we will uh, do that with other uh, classes as well. Process monitor tells you a lot of information about the processes that are running and the memory used. So if you have, for example, the TrueCrypt, you can look for the TrueCrypt process and have a good look at the TrueCrypt process with, for example, the Win debugger to, find, to see if you can find the keys. Uh, process Explorer dives even deeper into it. All the uh, hooks and all the DLLs that are loaded. DLLs are fantastic. It also gives you the opportunity to, uh, to hook. A hook is that you um, intercept system calls. So, or calls in general. So we saw in the earlier, earlier example that there was a call made to a message box and we could hook that. So we could create our own little piece of software and, uh, and redirect 
the call to our software. Instead of going to the actual function, it will go to us. Remember the password thing? It had a valid, validate log on. Validate whether the password is correct. I could hook that very easily. Just create my own code and change the call to my code instead of to the validate. And then I can say, oh yeah, that's the right password. I mean, that's, or I could see what it's giving to me. I could hook, for example, TrueCrypt. And there might be a, uh, there might be a, 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 a method in there which says decrypt data. I could hook that. And probably it will hand me the key to decrypt it. So I hook it and I, I wait. I sit and wait. And all of a sudden, bam, I'm called. And then I look on the, where would that data be? Where would the key be? If I get called to decrypt something, where does it typically store data for me? When a, when a method is called, where would it be? On the? If I hear the answer. Stack. The stack, yeah. The stack is where you put temporary data. Typically, data for a method is on the stack. So I can hook the decrypt function wait until it's called and when it is called I look on the stack and I expect to find the decryption key there it could be as simple as that so there's a lot of tricks that you could use uh, CLR profiler uh, this is a tool for .NET uh, applications and you can see exactly what's happening in your .NET application uh, process dump it's a nice application tells you a lot about the process Cain enable, cool tool, will decrypt uh, a lot of uh, Microsoft passwords, always nice. Uh, it is proper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, block crack is an even better tool, but it costs money. Mm -hmm. And the last slide in the series is this one. Uh, volatility is awesome, but that's what Arnhem is going to tell you about. Uh, during the uh, pra uh, pr during the lab, that's, that's we're going to do a lab. Volatility is a is a platform to do uh, memory analysis. Well, thank you for your attention and have a lot of fun at the lab.